good. So I'm going to focus in on the infiltrative inflammatory cardiomyopathies. This is where you get to put on your medical school hat, your residency hat, right, and consider those, those uh, systemic diagnoses. Oh, okay. Green, green. Mm. green, go, red, stop, right? So we're talking about the cardiomyopathies. When you have a myocardial problem, not felt to be due to ischemic disease, hypertension, right? Those are the two most commonest cause for heart failure in the Western world. Valve disease, constriction. And so the systemic diseases, you see the list there on your hard uh, left. So what I want to focus in on are the details really related to the three that are associated. One, they're the more commonest of the infiltrated cardiomyopathies. And as Dr. Park had highlighted from the uh, Felker paper just now, 15 years old, associated with a poor prognosis, certainly worse than that of, than that of idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which is a fancy way of saying we've excluded everything that we think we can, and they have a cardiomyopathy of, of unclear etiology. But patients with sarcoid, hemochromatosis, and amyloid um, tend not to do well, certainly three, five years survival. So when to suspect um, sarcoid, it, at least when they're, in terms of potential heart uh, involvement? Remember, this is granulomatous disease um, in different organ systems. When it's involving the heart, clinical heart failure, underlying AV blocks, ventricular dysrhythmias, um, certainly concerning. But in the company of it keeps, these patients can have neuro manifestations, symptomatic pulmonary disease not related to the heart, and as you see the other uh, list there, and hypercalcemia may be a, a tip-off. I think it's nice to refer back to the um, criteria, and, and two or more of the major listed there have alluded to advanced block, basal thinning of the ventricular septum, which can be appreciated by echo. Um, if you have access to gallium uptake scanning, positive cardiac uptake, certainly in the context of an ejection fraction. So two of the four major um, you're concerned. And you can have one of the uh, four major and two of the minor as listed, and this is where ECG, echo, and, and uh, scintigraphy and cardiac MRI can play a role um, to increase your suspicion for underlying um, sarcoid. Now, you're going to have a talk tomorrow by Dipin Shah, who's really a, a, a leader in the field of cardiac MRI, and he's going to go over how we use MRI in general, and there, this has been a real role for us in, in heart failure. Gadolinium uptake when there's extracellular expansion. The pattern of gadolinium uptake can give us a hint as to the underlying potential etiology. And so sarcoid in particular can manifest with mid-wall hyper-enhancement um, or epicardial hyper-enhancement, and that's different from other patterns as, as detailed there. So when we're, when we're suspicious and we have evidence of biopsy-proven uh, granulomas and there's cardiac um, amyloid, while there's really a paucity of trials, there's been several uncontrolled case series about using uh, anti-inflammation medicine, and I think the standard is high-dose cortical steroids. Now, we can argue the dose, typically it's, it's higher dose prednisone. Um, our bias is up to as, as high as 60 milligrams for several weeks with a gradual taper, but the thought and the communication to the patient and their families, you're using steroids for, for several months. And there have been some reports that this may um, augment um, um, cardiac reverse remodeling and improve um, survival. And so I think patients with sarcoid, the, the, the disease-specific treatment is steroids. So keep that in mind. Let's transition to hemochromatosis, which arguably is, is, is the worst of the three in terms of long-term survivorship. There are two types, primary hemochromatosis due to increased GI absorption or abnormal metabolism. And I'll give you the, uh, the, the, the table that, that details the hereditary um, component. That's compared to secondary iron overload, uh, for example, the hereditary anemia is where there's iron excess. Um, iron can cause cardiac injury in way of fibrosis, ischemia. This can lend to diastolic dysfunction and can lend to um, LV remodeling and what we see in terms of dilated cardiomyopathy. And I think it's important to understand the screening for the genetic component when the hereditary disorders are excluded. Um, the, the laboratory testing to keep in mind, transferrin saturation greater than 45 percent. Ferritin, which is an acute phase reactant, can be elevated for other causes, but when you see it in, in this phenotype, over 300 
um, micrograms per liter, be concerned. And again, cardiac, it's the cardinal symptoms of, 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 of heart failure, breathlessness, and or fatigue. Um, they can have palpitations and presyncope or syncope, in addition to the other systemic manifestations as listed here. Cardiac MRI is your friend in contrast to hyperenhancement with the use of gadolinium. Um, our cardiac MRI colleagues can measure myocardial T2 and normal is greater than 20 milliseconds. When it's less than 20 milliseconds, it's abnormal. I defer all questions related to T2 imaging to Dr. Dipin Shah tomorrow. Um, he is truly, a, tr truly a, a, an expert. But we use this to exclude iron excess in the heart. Cardiac MRI is the gold standard. You don't need to go biopsy a heart to screen for iron excess. You can obtain cardiac MRI. And again, disease-specific treatment. For a primary hemochromatosis, either due to GI uh, increased absorption or, or um, altered metabolism, it's phlebotomy. That's in contrast to secondary hemochromatosis, where we focus in on iron collation, and this is typically done uh, in consultation with um, our hematology colleagues. Now, there's no, you know, we talked a lot about evidence-based therapy for patients with stage C heart failure. As it relates to sarcoid and hemochromatosis, intriguing use of ACE and or ARBs, there's an anti -forbotic property. Um, and, and so I typically use evidence-based therapy in, in, in this, these two patient populations. In contrast, those with amyloid, they may be, may be more sensitive to, to side effects with these medicines, which I will define. So let's jump into amyloid. Really, to, to keep it simple, there are two types. Um, amyloid due to AL, light chain disease, is related to a plasma cell dyscrasia, the bone marrow is producing these abnormal fibrils that can deposit in the heart, nerves, kidneys, GI tract. That's in contrast to transthyretin-related liver disease, where the liver is producing this abnormal fibril. That's either a hereditary, um, and there's an example of the, of, of the variant mutations, versus senile or, or non-hereditary. And AL of the amyloid types is, is the most um, common, and unfortunately, it defines the prognosis for a patient with AL systemic amyloidosis. Um, I think in terms of screening, it's important to keep in mind that your first test should be screening for free uh, light chains. Free light chains elevation precedes the development of the clinical um, phenotype. So for AL amyloid, you have these insoluble beta-pleated sheets that lend to extracellular fibrosis and, and destruction in the heart. For the liver producing this abnormal fibril, it's really just an abnormal uh, uh, tetramer that can do the exact same thing as, um, as uh, the AL variant. And when to suspect, so when you see patients, at least for AL, that have hypertrophy um, on echo, so greater than 1.2, uh, the septal and or posterior wall, Without, explained, without it being explained perhaps by hypertension, that can be a con confounder. If they have nephrotic syndrome or spilling a lot of protein in their urine, um, concomitant hepatomegaly or any of the other signs there, especially in the context of, of a monoclonal gammopathy, you want to exclude AL amyloid. And again, the free light chain, it's either lambda or, or kappa. The, the lambda light chain uh, proteinemia is a hallmark of AL amyloidosis. And I've given you the reference for the free light chain ratios. You're looking for the involved versus uninvolved, and the ratios would be very high. While this can be influenced by, this, by renal failure, this is going to be your first test. This is the definitive diagnostic criteria. You need to prove it in an organ. You can look at fat pad. We typically like to uh, demonstrate this by endomyocardial biopsy. So if you um, have a positive Congo red stain by light microscopy, that's sent out for confirmatory testing by either mass spectroscopy or immune electron microscopy to, to type the amyloid. You want to be crystal clear, is this AL? That's going to go down a different type of treatment pathway versus TTR. And so you need, you need tissue. In terms of the clinical features, imaging, uh, and biomarkers, um, a big tongue bruising in and around the eye, that's more typical for AL versus TTR. This concept of low voltage on EKG, um, its accuracy is not um, where, where we would want it. I want you to keep in mind, certainly to prognosticate biomarkers, BNP and, and troponin. Um, they can predict survival, and they can predict um, whether one's going to do well with autologous stem cell transplant for AL, trying to create the best scenario for disease remission. I've mentioned the echo um, stigmata. 
um, a unique form of, of strain imaging that can be seen with AL or TTR is relative apical sparing. And so for those labs that are reporting on radial longitudinal strain, this could be a clue. And again, I've talked about um, MRI. This will be highlighted tomorrow. But the classic is global subendocardial enhancement, as you can see by the arrow. This can be patchy. It doesn't have to be uh, global. But that's the typical scenario with reasonable sensitivity and specificity. Um, keep this in mind. Uh, technetium pyrophosphate can differentiate, testing can differentiate between TTR and AL, uh, where the ratio, and you just look at it opposite the heart compared to uptake in the heart, ratio over 1.5 TTR versus not high in AL. And this has been proven to be fairly accurate and is available here in the United States. So here's the algorithm, the clinical features of heart failure, heart failure preserved ejection fraction, keep this in the back of your mind. You should send off free light chains. If that's negative um, and MRI is not in keeping with typical amyloid, uh, consider uh, technetium pyrophosphate, genetic testing for those with um, TTR, and I'm happy to share this slide with you. Supportive treatment is the mainstay. Keep in mind for AL, beta blockers may not be tolerated. We avoid digoxin. Um, um, while one can say there's not a survival benefit with AICD, we, we pursue it because these patients can die of uh, ventricular tachycardia or VFib. Um, just briefly, there are two multicenter trials to alter, potentially alter the natural progression of TTR amyloid, um, and those are highlighted here. Transplant for end-stage amyloid, whether it's AL or TTR, is a real option, with post-transplant survivorship, as listed here, um, being very, very good. Certainly in the context of newer chemotherapy for AL, we consider heart-liver transplant in those with TTR, because that's um, what the problem, and we link for AL, stem cell transplant after heart transplant to improve survival. This is a zebra, but if you don't know what a zebra looks like, you'll never see it. So keep these, this criteria in mind. So cardiac sarcoid hemochromatosis, these are part of systemic diseases. The suspicion I highlighted, disease-specific treatment. Send an advanced heart failure treatment program if you're worried about end-stage stigmata. So that is it, you guys. Um, we are going to stay here for questions. Um, I don't want to be in front of you and lunch any longer. Um, so I invite those who have questions to come to the table. Thank you.